How is it traveling with a girl? It's just so, like, um, guy, what's girl. it like being a chick and a man? Like, yeah, what? I'll what? just go f <laughs> Now, this is a question for Cassidy, something every guy wants to know. What's your type of guy? Uh, um, Gay marriage just got legalized everywhere in the United States. Really fucking awesome. What we need to understand and remember every single day that the people who suppress our creativity, suppress our individuality, and our freedom, they are not the gatekeepers to our acceptance in this life. I love women. <laughs> the late 2000s was a poster era for the alternative music scene. Warped Tour was at its peak. Genre-defining albums like Paramore's Riot and Fall Out Boy's Infinity on High were released into the world. Universally loved band Imagine Dragons formed. But like all music communities, basically since the beginning of time, an undercurrent of sexism plagued the alt world. The scene was dominated by all-male bands, and women really did have to fight to be represented and recognized for their contributions to the alternative music genre. Like in 2014, women made up a mere 15% of bands playing The Fest in Gainesville and Riot Fest in Chicago. On Warp Tour, the number was only 6% that year. For a long time, the most visible woman in this particular scene was probably Haley Williams from Paramore. The singer has obviously been an unstoppable force since the release of Paramore's first album in 2005. Thriving in a male-dominated emo scene and going on to influence the modern wave of unapologetic female artists. And from what I've been able to tell, Haley has been featured on the cover of Alternative Press magazine at least nine times, far surpassing any other female artist, if that is an indicator. <laughs> But okay, the thing with Haley Williams ostensibly becoming the figurehead for female-fronted alternative bands at the time was that she kind of became a crutch for music writers to compare every alternative frontwoman to. Filing them in the old girl rock singer folder and saying that due to this fact, they obviously all sound exactly like Paramore, right? <laughs> Fans of old school Paramore are sure to enjoy Paris's new album. I'm gonna start this review with an apology because it is impossible to write about a female fronted pop punk band without mentioning Paramore. On first look, it would be easy to dismiss We Are The In Crowd as just another pop rock quintet following in the footsteps of Paramore. Manners could easily pass for a Paramore song because of Jardine's vocals and the instrumental parts of the chorus and bridge. I just get this huge wave of Paramore. You'd be hard pressed to find any reference to Hey Monday that doesn't immediately mention Paramore. Both bands have some similarities in their styles of music and song types, as well as how Pope and Haley Williams have similar sounding voices. Sounds a lot like a poor man's Paramore with an even hotter front woman. Hey Monday has always been Paramore's adorable little sister. Both female fronted bands indulge in pop punk's cliches, but in most circles, Paramore comes out as the clear musical victor before the discussion inevitably turns to a who's hotter contest, Cassidy Pope or Haley Williams? Cassidy Pope is the answer, by the way. And despite the fact that most of the bands that get this label thrown around all the time actually sound nothing like Paramore, <laughs> they just have girl that sing good. All right, I did it, pay me pitchfork. <laughs> In reality, alternative front women have fucked shit up for decades and will continue to fuck shit up for decades. And in the late 2000s, women like Cassidy Pope of Hey Monday, Tay Jardine of We Are The In Crowd, Jenna McDougal of Tonight Alive, and Lynn Gunn of Paris, each carved out their own distinct space in the scene and continue to make their mark to this day. As a music person, and also just someone who was genuinely really inspired by them back in the day, I feel like they all deserve their own spotlight and credit for making the alternative music world a more diverse, empowering, and honestly stronger place to exist as a woman for artists and fans alike. So let's get into it. <laughs> Let's start with former power pop queen, current country pop star, Cassidy Pope. Cassidy fronted rock band Hey Monday, a fun, high emotions, high tempo alt group that was active from 2008 to 2011, when the band took an indefinite hiatus. Cassidy is originally from Wellington, Florida, and while attending Wellington High School, she and her friend Mike Gentile formed her first band, Blake. Then in 2008, she and Gentile linked up with Alex Lipshaw, Jersey Moriarty, and Elliot James to officially form the band Hey Monday. Much 
like Panic at the Disco before them, Hey Monday was actually discovered by one Pete Wentz, who heard their demo when he was in the Crush management office one day. You should go out and buy the new Hey Monday record. I was getting there. I, oh, didn't I, there I, I didn't know if you forgot the name of it. No, dude, did you look at my iTunes playlist? Without, without Hey Monday, I'm nothing. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> he wanted to sign them to his label, Decadence, but there was also some interest from Columbia Records, so the band ended up signing a joint label deal. Hey Monday's debut album, Hold On Tight, debuted in 2008, and though it didn't get much mainstream attention at the time, it did end up on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart, which is like a chart for upcoming artists. The album was lauded for its catchiness and its power chords. Basically, the sonic simplicity mixed with Cassidy's ability to write a really solid hook made a really solid album and one that above all was fun. <laughs> They started touring extensively once this album dropped, opening for bands like The Academy Is, We The Kings, A Rocket To The Moon, etc. And in 2009, they leveled up, opening up for Fall Out Boy on their national and international tours. Pete, I just want to know, what's it like yeah. touring with a band that you signed to your very own record label? Are you taking up everybody's time right now? Hey Monday, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Fun fact, Cassidy actually appeared in the music video for Fall Out Boy's America's Sweethearts in 2008. This was a turning point for Hey Monday. The band was finally starting to get some recognition, and they actually went on their first ever headlining tour, the Let's Make a Mess tour. 2010 saw the release of their second album, Beneath It All. Honestly, this album was kind of hailed as Hey Monday's sophomore slump, a watered down or maybe popped up <laughs> version of the lively pop punk that had gotten them so popular in the first place. Critics said like the guitars were too far back in the mix and there was a pop sheen over everything and their edge was basically gone. Sean Reed wrote for Alter the Press that songs like Mr. Pushover sound kind of like Taylor Swift B-sides, <laughs> which is maybe why I love the album so much. <laughs> The band seemed to be there solely to back Cassidy rather than create anything interesting. Like, does this album sound a little bit like the Hannah Montana soundtrack? Yes. But is that a bad thing? Hey Monday then went on a touring blitz to promote this new record. They played the Alternative Press Tour alongside Never Shout Never, Bamboozle, Warp Tour, and Jimmy Kimmel all in 2010. Relentless was an understatement. 2011 was the band's last year before announcing their split, and they went out with a bang. <laughs> After re-releasing their second EP, Candles, the titular song was actually used in an episode of Glee. <laughs> really came together this week as a team. Yeah, a gay team. It was a duet between Kurt and Blaine, and it was honestly just a sweet gay moment for everyone. <laughs> hey Monday did some more touring with All Time Low and then Never Shout Never, departed from their record labels, self-released a Christmas EP, and then ceased to exist. Until November 2019, just eight years later, when they reunited. Even though it was just for one night, they played a whole set as part of this Nashville pop punk thing called Hey It's Monday, and it was a triumphant moment for power pop fans everywhere. So where is she now? Once Hey Monday was officially donezo, Cassidy released her first self-titled EP before auditioning for and later winning season three of The Voice. <laughs> Not to be like so utterly predictable, but here's some Avril Lavigne clips. <laughs> The 
This was when Country Cassidy was kind of born. She signed with country label Republic Nashville in 2013 and then put out her debut country album, Frame by Frame. The things that country music and pop punk have in common are the emotional side of things. One of my favorite Hey Monday songs, Candles, would be a great country song. Power lines went out and I am all alone. But I don't really care at all, not answering my phone. In 2016, she put out an EP called Summer, and after a few years of country features and singing the Star Spangled Banner at sporting events. Oh, say can you see? She released her second full-length album, Stages, in 2019, and her third, Rise and Shine, in 2020. Why was she important? Hey Monday was one of the first bands with a female vocalist in this particular alt scene to really make it big, and thus they were one of the first bands in this alt scene to be incessantly compared to Paramore and Haley Williams, though certainly not the last. <laughs> so as Hey Monday's star grew bigger and bigger in the scene, it's like Cassidy had more and more to prove. Like, she wasn't just a knockoff Haley Williams, she wasn't just a pretty face put there to sell more records. The popular direction of Hey Monday was an artistic choice and not just girl can't write hardcore songs like the dudes. <laughs> also, the versatility of Cassidy's output during her career and also her like unique career path showed that women in the alt scene don't need to be put into one box or one definition of success. I think a lot of people in the scene were kind of like, oh, she's a sellout when she went on The Voice and kind of took a country direction, but I urge you to ask why we feel this way about a woman making big moves in the music industry. And in terms of her new sound, like obviously Cassidy did go country once she left The Voice, but <laughs> recently she's been putting out new music that does have kind of a pop punk tinge to it, kind of a combination of both genres, which really pays homage to her roots in pop punk and kind of power pop, and is just a sound that's all her own. Basically this, as well as her being vocal recently about feminism and condemning bigoted men in the country music scene, makes Cassidy an integral part of the late 2000s alternative canon. Next up is vibrant alt powerhouse Tay Jardine from five-piece pop punk group We Are The In Crowd. <laughs> Tay grew up in Liberty, New York and first sang lead vocals in her high school band, Sophomore. We Are The In Crowd formed in Poughkeepsie, New York in 2009 and actually were officially just called The In Crowd. Fronted by Tay and supported by Jordan X, Mike Ferry, Rob Cianelli, and Cameron Hurley. The group played energetic pop rock with consistently duetting vocals, as Tay and Jordan were kind of co-lead singers, singing different conflicting perspectives, and kind of like shaping this unique form of pop punk storytelling. Their social presence kind of started with a bang, as in April 2009, their MySpace page was hacked by an ex-member of the band who basically wiped the whole thing, deleted their music and their friends. Gotta love hackers. This story was apparently big alt news, and when AbsolutePunk.net wrote an article about the hacking, it caught the attention of Hopeless Records. Uh, we just signed up Hopeless Records. You did? Yep. Hmm. Soon after, they signed with Hopeless, changed their name to We Are The In Crowd because of some kind of a copyright thing with a 70s reggae band, and <laughs> released their first single, For The Win, all in 2009. 2010 saw the band put out their first EP, Guaranteed To Disagree, produced by Zach Odom and Kenneth Mount, who had worked with bands like All Time Low and Mayday Parade. They also played Warp Tour for the first time this year. This was followed up by their first full-length album, Best Intentions, in 2011, which debuted on the US Billboard 200 at number 22, and was praised for being a more mature, tightened up, somehow even more energetic version of the sound that they brought to the table on Guaranteed to Disagree. They spent the next
next few years playing festivals and touring with bands like All Time Low and Mayday Parade respectively. The world wouldn't see their next album until 2014 when Weird Kids was released. Another collection of sugary, sweet pop punk tracks that had publications all excited that once the mainstream caught on to this band, they would be huge. That was like a consistent theme in all of their reviews. Unfortunately, this would be their last release. Even though all throughout 2015, the band kept teasing their progress on an upcoming third album that would never see the light of day. By 2016, the band had announced an indefinite hiatus. When we set out last year to write the follow-up to Weird Kids, we went into the studio in much smaller numbers and with a different mindset than we had on previous releases. The results were something that embodied the spirit of We're the In Crowd in a lot of ways, but at the same time went against everything that We're the In Crowd was and continues to be. Thank you to everyone that has supported our band since day one. Hopefully we've had the kind of impact on each of your lives that you had on ours. I know you might be bummed, but we promise this isn't goodbye. It's BRB. Zing. At this point, Tay started to perform under the name Saint, working with old band members Mike Ferry and Cameron Hurley on this solo effort. But not so fast. In Hey Monday tradition, We Are The In Crowd pop back up out of nowhere in 2019, reigniting their social media with an illustration of the whole band like as cowboys riding in on a white stallion. Just some standalone artwork to get the old heart racing. <laughs> and just two days later, wouldn't you know it, We Are The In Crowd graced the lineup of the Slam Dunk Fest in the UK, and there you have it, reunion confirmed. <laughs> look at us. Hey, look at us. Look at us. Huh? Who would've thought? Not me. So where is she now? Like I mentioned before, she started her solo project Saint once We Are The In Crowd was put to bed. It's like a lush electropop sound for Tay as she kind of accesses a softer, breathier vocal range with like melodic bubbly synths and it's still very like emotionally resonant. I don't know, I really like it, honestly. <laughs> the debut album for Saint was called Smile and Wave, and it was released in June of 2017. And most recently, she's released an EP called Bad Summer in 2019. So why is she important? In her years in We Are The In Crowd, Tay has been outspoken about her experiences of sexism in the alternative scene, specifically sharing a story with Fuse for their article, Here's What It's Like Being a Female Musician on Warp Tour. She said, Before we had our own crew, we'd use the house monitors and we're checking all the instruments and the sound guy would ignore me. I'd have to say, excuse me, I need the bass up. And he'd say, honey, honey, we already did the bass. I'm like, I know, but I can't hear it now. I'm not stupid. We just played a song and now I can't hear it. It used to happen all the time. I also used to not get let into the venue. In 2018, she also spoke candidly and at length to Kerrang about her mental health journey and her experiences with depression, especially post We Are The In Crowd. Raising awareness and urging fans to seek professional help if they're struggling, and also opening up about her turbulent experience with antidepressant medication. And just on a personal note, Tay's presence in the alternative music scene when I was a teenager and one show in particular still stands out to me as this like eye-opening moment when I first really internalized that women can do alternative music. But I was actually going to a Hey Monday headlining show in New Haven, and so it's not like I wasn't expecting to see like a woman on stage, but I really only was going for them. I didn't know any of the other bands playing. So just like going off of my previous experience, I naturally assumed that every other band would be all dudes. And when the lights went down and Miss Tay herself rocketed onto the stage, the amount of like utter shock and joy in my ninth grade body was immeasurable. <laughs> and that's when I first started to think about like why do I automatically assume that every band is gonna be all men all the time? Or maybe like one girl, but like only one allowed. <laughs> like why is the scene structured this way? Like isn't the alt scene's inherent sexism plus my own internalized sexism kind of fucked up? <laughs> I don't know, it just like, meant a lot to me and I keep going back to that moment and so yeah her veracity and just her presence in the alt scene in general made a big difference to me and I'm sure a lot of other girls in like smelly rock clubs around that time. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about Jenna McDougall, the Australian tour de force of the alt world and the front woman of the band Tonight Alive. Jenna was born in Sydney, Australia, and growing up she participated in school choirs and musicals, igniting her interest in music. Before joining the band Tonight Alive, she played a lot of solo acoustic shows around Sydney, Australia. <laughs> And then in 2008, she asked local bassist Cam Adler to help her record some demos, and then he was like, 
oh, I have a band that doesn't have a vocalist. Do you want to record demos for that? And she was like, yeah. And the rest is history. <laughs> you know, all the girls were awesome, but I guess there was just something about Jen just playing drums in the back that was just really cool. And it's pretty amazing that a lot came from something so small such as this. And by the way, this whole time she was in high school, like their first band practice was the day before her 16th birthday and she hadn't even graduated before they recorded their first album together. Like, woo! Tonight Alive, consisting of Jenna, Cam Adler, Jay Cardi, and Wakayo Tahi, later replaced by Maddie Best, definitely represents the more punk side of pop punk, embracing a heavier emo sound that really contrasted with the kind of stuff that Hey Monday and We're The In Crowd were putting out, the more up-tempo pop-infused music. <laughs> Their sound has been described as ferocious, elegant, powerful. <laughs> They released their first self-funded EP, All Shapes and Disguises, in 2009, and then in 2010 they released a three-track EP called Consider This. After which they toured nationally in Australia and started to catch the eye of some big record labels. They ended up putting out their debut full-length record with help from legendary pop-punk producer Mark Trombino, known for launching the careers of bands like Blink-182, Motion City Soundtrack, etc. <laughs> this album, What Are You So Scared Of, came out in 2011 and featured some re-recordings of songs that they had put on their first two EPs, as well as guest vocals from Mark Hoppus of Blink-182. <laughs> and it was regarded highly in the alternative music sphere. Like, critics thought that it sat very neatly on the line between the pop and punk sides of pop punk, and were excited to see which sound the band would expand on as they progress in their career. Like, would they start doing hook-filled pop punk? Would they delve into sort of a harder rock sound? Who knew at this point? Like, the alt world was their oyster. <laughs> in the next few years, they hit the festival circuit hard, playing Bamboozle and Warp Tour, and also embarking on the Fearless Friends Tour with Bless the Fall. Their widely praised sophomore full length, The Other Side, an album that really saw them perfect their craft, especially in terms of Jenna's like dark confessional lyricism, came out in 2013, featuring one of my personal faves, Lonely Girl. <laughs> Next came third album, Limitless, in 2016, a step into a more polished pop ballad sound that at its best was ambitious and fun, and at its worst was maybe a little bit cheesy and dampened. If you waited for a sign, you're living with the fate to fall, hoping if you close your eyes, you'll make it all invisible. Is this a big part, Jen? Oh, it's probably the biggest fan on the record. <laughs> 2017 saw Tonight Alive make the switch to Hopeless Records and put out Underworld, their hard-hitting fourth studio album that really saw the band tap into their raw pop-punk roots, notably with a vocal feature from Lynn Gunn of the band Paris. Uh, stick around to hear more on her. <laughs> and basically, in 2018, the band announced a touring hiatus, saying they were trying to prioritize their mental and physical health. And even though we miss them dearly, go off. <laughs> Self-care. Self more like, what, like are what are so you so scared of? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> That's not going to make it in. <laughs> so where is she now? As far as I can tell, Jenna has gone basically MIA, other than popping up on socials every now and then to post about Black Lives Matter and mental health and have I mentioned how much I stan her? <laughs> she only posts like once a month and the band's last posts were in February of last year, so it seems like they really are taking the break that they need. So why is she important? Throughout her career, Jenna has made it a priority to use her platform to uplift women. Like, okay, so before embarking on an Australian tour in 2017, the band orchestrated this competition for local bands to fill the opener slot but you could only enter if your band had at least one female member. <laughs> She's also been outspoken about women controlling their own image and creative output. I think one of my fuck this moments would definitely be shaving my head last right. year, which some people would think would be like a meltdown situation, but it wasn't, it was just a total, I, I keep going for the word rebuttal, but I really want to use a different word. It's kind of like a, I was just counteracting the, the oppression that I felt. And someone said to me recently that the more polished our sound became over our career, the less polished my um, image was, which was really cool because mm -hmm. I became more angry and more fierce and more 
like empowered in a way. And I don't want to be conventionally beautiful and I don't want that to control me. Like, I know that that's what Sony wanted from me. I know that mm. they were really pushing for me to stand out from the guys and for me to have a more feminine image and stuff like that. But it's not really what I resonated with. I'm learning a lot about boundaries. Yeah. I, I am happy to say no when I need to say no mm -hmm. now. And that's like, um, it's been a really healthy uh, learning curve for me. And it's something mm -hmm. that I'm happy to do every day now. I'm not afraid to let people down because that's, you know, their feelings are not my responsibilities. Jenna is also a vocal advocate for Black Lives Matter, centering the movement on her social media and also protesting for indigenous rights in Australia. Throughout her career, she's basically just been fearless about speaking up for what she believes in and what matters, making the music world a better place for generations of non-cis white men to come. <laughs> Lastly, we're gonna touch on one of my all-time favorite front women in the alt scene, as well as a queer icon and vocal legend, Lynn Gunn of the band Paris. Lynn Gunn, born Lindsay Gunn Olsen, grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts. As a teen, she participated in the Battle of the Bands at Lowell High School and graduated in 2012. Apparently, she was originally planning to attend Mass Art, but ended up pursuing Paris as a full-time project and spent some time working at Hot Topic and Guitar Center to support herself. She's always been fascinated with death and graveyards and the occult, and these dark themes, as well as inspiration from her struggle with depression, have been present in her songwriting since day one. Paris was officially formed in 2012 under the name Operation Guillotine. Dream emo band name, to be honest. <laughs> But when they made the sonic switch from metalcore to post-hardcore, they rebranded as Paris. Originally, it was just Paris with the A, but apparently a member of Fleetwood Mac has a side project under that name, so they changed it to the V for legal reasons as well as just looking sick as fuck. In 2014, after a few years of touring and garnering buzz on the Warp Tour Ernie Ball Battle of the Band stage, as well as hitting the studio with Blake Harnage of the band Versa Emerge, the band signed to Rise Records. Paris's debut album, White Noise, was released into the world November 2014, with standout singles St. Patrick and My House that drove up excitement in the alt world. With St. Patrick especially, people got really excited about their incorporation of electronic and pop elements into their brand of post-hardcore, as well as Lynn's powerful growling vocals. It just really set them apart from the other Warp Tour type bands that were out there at the time. They did a bunch of tours with bands like Fall Out Boy, Pierce the Veil, and Bring Me the Horizon, embarking on their very first headlining tour in 2016. In keeping with Lynn's fascination with all things spooky, the band recorded their second album, All We Know of Heaven, All We Need of Hell, in a haunted church turned recording studio in upstate New York. The, the church was haunted. When you hear the new record, there's like some harmonies with ghosts <laughs> in the... In His the name band. was Paul. Paul. Um, Paul Lee. <laughs> Polly G. That was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> and the album was released in August 2017. This record received nearly universal acclaim, as the band kind of veered deeper into their intense, fierce, brooding sound, while still having songwriting that kept the songs as catchy as they were explosive. <laughs> Then in 2019, Paris continued to move up in the world, signing with Reprise Records, an imprint of Warner Records, and releasing their EP Hallucinations. Leaning more heavily on their electronic influence sound and receiving critical as well as commercial success. Their third full-length album, Use Me, was released August 2020. And upon the unveiling of the album's first single, Deadweight, it was declared the hottest record in the world by BBC Radio One. <laughs> This album's significance was huge for Lynn. 
She felt finally able and ready to take credit for all the work she'd been doing behind the scenes with Paris, shedding the idea that the band as a whole always has to take credit, and stepping into the spotlight with long-earned confidence. Upon the album announcement, she shared, I allowed myself to support a narrative I thought I had to support, of Paris being a band. I didn't really have a role model for this. Coming from a band culture, it's about how the group is always greater than the sum of its parts and you're not supposed to take credit, even if you do everything. There's no template or role model for really owning it as a woman. I wanted to make everyone else happy and uphold an image I thought we had to. Growing up, I learned I don't have to do that anymore. I'm finally allowing myself to take credit. I've got the full support and encouragement of my bandmates. Paris is a unit and very much a team, but the heart and soul of the vision and music always has sourced from me. I'm just saying it now. I fulfilled my own vision of what a role model should be. And the lyrical content of this batch of songs really reflects this honesty. Like, Deadweight is all about boundaries and power and not having to be a people pleaser, especially as a woman. <laughs> us right up to the present day, Paris released the most recent single, Monster, in July 2021. So where is she now? At the moment, Lynn is out on tour with Paris after releasing Monster, and uh, fingers crossed we'll get an album announcement soon. <laughs> Happy to end this off with an artist whose band is still active. Like, pop punk really isn't dead. <laughs> so why is she important? Along with her role of empowering women in the music scene to take what they're owed, a huge element of Lynn's public persona is her status as an LGBT advocate and she's become a prominent gay voice in the alternative music scene. I think the first time I actually had to like sit somebody down and, and talk about it was with my parents, but I had written them a letter instead, and then I left for two weeks to go on tour and let them sit with that. It's actually pretty natural, just always kind of was. She stands strong on the importance of herself being out and having a platform to spread acceptance. Oh no, <laughs> even if it falls, we'll still be gay. <laughs> I feel like a, a very gay Bob Ross or something. I heard you're gay. <laughs> Me too. It's great. Who else here is so gay? She's really just a super positive role model for being yourself at all costs. Redefining not only the heteronormative ideals of the alt genre, but also the beauty standards. She's distinctly androgynous in her style and consistently displays this confidence in her gender expression to her hordes of young fans. On National Coming Out Day in 2017, she shared her coming out story with Billboard and GLAAD, and then that same year presented Laura Jane Grace with the Icon Award at the APMAs. She's a flower. In a letter posted to Billboard, she wrote, Over the past few years, it's been the most powerful and humbling experience to watch the Paris fan base become such a safe place for people of the LGBTQ community. We have witnessed countless proposals, been a part of coming outs, read hundreds of letters, and have heard so many incredible stories. Thank you for all the love, support, and courage you have all given to me to be myself on this journey thus far. And thank you for the love, support, and courage you've given yourselves and others around you. I want nothing more than for you all to feel the utmost love and freedom in being yourselves. You are all exceptionally magic. So hey, um, it turns out I still love women. <laughs> Honestly, thank you so much for joining me on this deep dive of some of my favorite front women in one of my favorite, most personally nostalgic eras of alternative music. I'm just really glad that the next generation of women in the alternative scene have such a rich, sonically diverse roster of like predecessors to look back on and take cues from, and also just look at and be like, hey, they did it, I can do it. This is awesome. <laughs> and continue the fight to rectify the gender inequality in the scene. Fans like me grew up really without even questioning this gender inequality because it was so ingrained in the alternative scene. And now seeing these women take up space so powerfully and joyfully really changed how I saw myself and the scene in general. I think, or I hope, that in today's alternative music community, it's less of a question of wait, there's gender inequality? <laughs> and more of a question of women and trans people and people of color have always belonged in alternative music. 
what can we do to make space for them? Back in 2016, Haley Williams spoke to Rock Sound about her influence on women in the scene, as well as the importance of having powerful women to look up to for alternative musicians and fans alike. There's now going to be another generation of young women who are looking up to people like Lynn and Jenna. When I was starting out in a band, I had to take parts of my inspiration from males because there weren't enough women to really go around. I had to look at male musicians that I admired or looked up to and go, I think I can do this just as well as they can, but I had to find my own way of relating to them. That so many young women will now have more immediate relationships available and that there's so much more to be inspired by can only be a positive thing. Whew. Okay, thank you again so much for watching. If you could, I would love to have you subscribe. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you like this content, I would love if you dropped a like. That helps me out so much as a small creator. I have been Nina. I love you so much. Mwah. Bye. <laughs>